Good afternoon. I don't know what it's like there in the uh, Zoomiverse, but in the room here, the, the excitement is contagious. There's a, a lot of uh, great conviviality in here, and I'm really quite sorry to break it up, but um, I'm sure that once you've had a chance to hear today's speaker, you'll agree that it's um, not something we should postpone any longer. So my name is Adam Cohen. I am a professor in the art history department here at the University of Toronto. My own particular um, area of research interest is in the Middle Ages. And so it will be my, my great honor to be the host for tonight's lecture. And I'll introduce our speaker, Dr. Ephraim Tannerfogel in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates, which for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The occasion for our gathering this afternoon is the Isidore and Rosalie Sharp lecture, and um, we are indeed grateful to the Sharp family for supporting the initiatives of the Center for Jewish Studies. Thanks to their generosity, we are able to bring to our campus a distinguished speaker, Professor Ephraim Kannerfogel, who is the e. e. Billy Ivory University Professor of Jewish History, Literature and Law at Yeshiva University, where he is a core faculty member at the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies. Now, I'm tempted to say that Professor Kannerfogel is a Renaissance man, but that would be in that would not be fitting because we're really medievalists. Um, but I will say uh, formally that he is a lifetime fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research and has been a fellow of the Center for Advanced Jewish Studies at the University of Pennsylvania for many years. He has held visiting professorial appointments at Penn and at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev and has served as a vice president of the Association for Jewish Studies. An internationally recognized authority in the areas of medieval Jewish intellectual history and rabbinic literature, Professor Kannerfogel is the author of, first, Jewish Education and Society in the High Middle Ages in 1992, which not surprisingly won the National Jewish Book Award for scholarship. Second, he is the author of Hearing Through the Lattices, Mystical, Magical, and Pietistic Dimensions in the Tosafist Period in 2000, which was a finalist for the Coret Foundation Award in History. It's a great shame. It's one of my favorite books. I wasn't on the committee, unfortunately. Both books were published by Wayne State University Press and updated versions have been published in Hebrew. In addition, Professor Kannerfogel is the editor of three volumes on medieval Jewish history, literature, and thought, and the author of more than 100 articles. His book, The Intellectual History and Rabbinic Culture of Medieval Ashkenaz from 2013, won the prestigious Goldstein Gorin Award for the best book in Jewish thought. And this was awarded by the International Center for Jewish Thought at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. It was also awarded the Schnitzer Prize from the Association for Jewish Studies as being the best book in biblical and rabbinic studies. To boot, Professor Kannerfogel is um, a tireless um, servant of the field. And I'll just list one um, uh, item of service. He is the co-editor of the International Academic Journal, Jewish History. Finally, I call to your attention his most recent book, Brothers from Afar, Rabbinic Approaches to Apostasy and Reversion in Medieval Europe, also from Wayne State University Press in 2021. In this book, Professor Kannerfogel identifies and traces the changing rabbinic attitudes toward apostates from Judaism and their return against the backdrop of church policy and societal conventions and responses. We're fortunate that Professor Kanapogel has agreed to join us and will be sharing some of the material from that book in his lecture tonight. So please join me in welcoming Professor Brian Kanapogel. Thank you very much, Professor Cohn. Uh, good afternoon, it's very nice to be here in person. And I did bring my mask and wore it all through the airport, but uh, I have to speak now so that I'm going to take it off. Um, in any case, um, do you want this up or down for the tech people? It was sort of whatever. I, I don't mind. It's fine. Um, 
I don't I don't mind seeing myself at some point shocking. But, um, I, I don't know about being a Renaissance man, but I can say in light of Adam's remarks that I was born in the late Middle Ages. So um, in any case, uh, what I've come to, to bring you today actually is uh, something past the book, um, which the book certainly hints at, but I didn't want to just sort of rehash old territory. Uh, if you want to know better some of the things that I might refer to, you can certainly look at the book and uh, it's available for purchase uh, on Amazon and so on, and I'm joking. Um, my late mother was my best customer and she passed away several years ago. So the uh, lagoon in sales is just uh, <laughs> striking in any case. Um, so let me take you through uh, what emerges as a striking difference uh, in terms of how apostates were viewed in terms of gay rim. We're gonna talk about apostasy. Apostasy means in our discussion, apostasy from Judaism, someone who is born a Jew and she or he decides some point to move to the Christian religion or Christian society. And in the high middle ages, there was not Protestantism. There were not variations. There were some heresies in Christianity. There were not varieties in Judaism really in the way that we have them today. And so you were either in many respects in group A or group A, A1. And that movement is a very interesting phenomenon therefore. A convert, obviously, and this is true for Jewish or Christian context, but as we'll talk about it, a convert to Judaism means somebody who was born not as a Jew, born as a Christian. Um, I have a colleague who likes to distinguish between those who converted to Judaism or to Christianity and those who were cradle Christians or cradle Jews, very interesting phrase. Um, and I wanna look at these two different groups uh, at the same time, obviously one, one after the other, but at the same, in the same context and show you some very suggestive and I think nuanced differences between how rabbinic figures in this period that I'll talk about looked at each of these groups and try to account for some of these differences. You'll see little hints of this in the book, but this really hasn't been done. I'm playing with it and I'm gonna play along. A few folks will play along, you know, just kind of say, yeah, yeah. Uh, please, by the way, questions, seriously, I don't mean to play along at all. Uh, questions, comments, uh, suggestions. That's how I get to uh, tweak and uh, improve uh, my argumentation. Uh, mostly, of course, I do it with my graduate students, but I gave them the day off. So you folks are the uh, are the very excellent replacements. So let me give you a little bit of a script and we'll talk. According to Rashi's interpretation of the Talmudic vic uh, victim, dictum, uh, and Rashi, of course, arguably one of the greatest medieval Jewish commentators on the Talmud, on the Bible, uh, he wrote, he covered virtually the entire corpus of the Talmud, the oral law at the Bible, the written law in his lifetime. Uh, the question often comes up, how could one person have possibly done this? And the answer, which I won't elaborate on now, is that Rashi was someone who could apparently write with both feet and both hands at the same time. In any case, Rashi, who dies in 1105, I think the joke went right, anyway, um, sometimes they do. Rashi, who died in 1105, interpreted the following Talmudic dictum in an interesting way. Yisrael, afal pi shechata, Yisrael hu. Which simply put, it's based on the biblical verse, a Jew, even if she or he, he or she, has sinned grievously, remains a Jew, no matter what. And besides that interpretation of the Talmudic Dictum, and Rashi really pushed that interpretation, he also offered practical halacha guidance in several responses. Bottom line for Rashi, again, who dies in 1105, Northern France, studied in Germany, studied in the Rhineland. For Rashi, bottom line, a Jew who had converted to Christianity under duress or even willingly. This is a whole discussion of why and how people, Jews converted in this period, um, was still considered to be fully Jewish. There was no way to outrun that status. There's the flip side. As such, if somebody became an apostate from Judaism, again, under duress or willingly, we're talking about the period of the First Crusade here towards the end of Rashi's life, and so on. So this was an issue on the table, so to speak, unfortunately. Apostates who wish to return to the Jewish community, according to Rashi, were not required to undergo any formal rights to mark their reversion. Rights, R-I-T-E-S. They have to do anything or to otherwise demonstrate their contrition, all they had to do was rejoin the Jewish community in its religious life and practices. You were out, you're back in, assuming you fulfill your responsibilities. Okay. 
And that really, this position of Rashi was developed beautifully. You know, I'll sell someone else's book of many years ago, a classic. Uh, my doctor father, Professor Jacob Katz of the Hebrew University, uh, he took me on here in America after he retired from Hebrew University at age 67, the mandatory retirement age. And as he put it, but I'm a young man. So he came to America and he continued to teach. And luckily for me, I ended up with him. I don't think it was so lucky for him, but it was pretty lucky for me. Um, in the book, in the English version of the book, Exclusiveness and Tolerance, Ben Yedin Legoyim in Hebrew, Katz really shows the breadth and depth of Rashi's position. He's got some separate analysis of how this is derived from the Talmudic material. And to hear Katz tell it, this separates Mori Varabi, my, my teacher, my blessed teacher of blessed memory. Um, to hear Professor Katz tell it, this kind of view held sway throughout Northern Europe in the Middle Ages. And in fact, one of the things that changed the point of Professor Katz in modernity, sure we have some early modernists here maybe, right, is that again, since there were more options, right, a person that didn't have to be just Jewish or you know, Orthodox Jewish and observant Jewish or Catholic. There are many other options in between. Therefore, the returning apostate we find in the 16th century and beyond in Eastern Europe, all kinds of, not obstacles, perhaps hurdles for someone to come back. That's the Katz thesis. And again, it's all based on Rashi. Basically, Rashi won the day, and we're not so surprised to hear that. So one of the things that my book does is, and I had to ask myself almost every day, how come Professor Katz didn't seem to go for this? And the answer is that most of this comes from manuscript. We find, as, as it turns out, manuscripts that were really just not known in his day. I think I found one that we sort of knew about when he was alive, but it was so many years after he wrote his book. You know, we all have these nightmares that our earlier research will turn into a mush. And uh, so nobody ever acknowledges too much. From one line in some book published, you know, 20 years after he wrote this material, I would have expected him to uh, do an about face. But now we have a lot more manuscript material, which tells us that in the 12th century, after Rashi's death, several leading Talmudists and Halachists in Northern France and Germany who were known as the Tosafists. Those are not pugilists, they're medieval Talmudic commentators, starting with Rashi's descendants and his students and then burgeoning out. Um, they put forward a series of much more demanding requirements or somewhat more demanding, we'll see up to much more demanding, there's a range for those who sought to return to the Jewish community following a conversion to Christianity. The centerpiece of this effort because frankly, it was the least painful and it didn't cost a lot, well, joking, but not really, was ritual immersion. In other words, somebody coming back must immerse themselves. They must make that act. And even though a number of specific reasons were given or sometimes implied for this requirement, just in, not in no particular order, but just in order here, as a means of purification to achieve expiation, Right, even though the person can come back after having sinned, leaving the faith was quote unquote a sin, and therefore there was a need for purification, expiation, two, as an indication for the Jewish community of the sincerity and commitment of the returning apostate. Put it simply in modern terms, you had to do something. You couldn't just say, hi, I'm back. You wanted to show the community that you were kind of serious, right? Forgive my, uh, you know, uh, lingo. Um, or three, even as a kind of unbaptism, which in many ways is the most interesting possibility, and that comes up explicitly, but mostly implicitly. So those are the reasons, but there's a whole group of Rashi's followers, students, even descendants, who adopt this view. Not everyone, but there's a whole group of such Tosafists. It gets even more intense. Several German Tosafists, what I've just described to you is mostly the French position, we'll come back to that. Several German Tosafists in fact, ruled that reverting apostates, right, apostates who reverted, conversion, reversion, definitional issues, but I think it's simple enough, should be treated largely as converts to Judaism. There's a model, treat them as converts. And the main reason for that was to establish, confirm, verify the sincerity of their intent. In other words, these stringencies weren't necessarily put on because the apostates were disliked, but there's a need to verify. And so if you make 
more restrictions, more things that have to be done, that might accomplish that. The Northern French Tosafists, though, continue to maintain, that's what I want to talk about today, continue to ma maintain a clear distinction between these two categories. Right? According to the German perspective, just to give you perhaps the strongest example, uh, a German scholar named Eliezer Ben Joel Halevi, who goes by the acronym Ravia of Keln, who dies in 1225. Here's the quote. Uh, and that's, you have that in source number one on your handouts. I hope the people in Zoom land have some access. I want to thank, by the way, the folks here. It's so wonderful to work with uh, Constance. They do a lot of the heavy lifting, but you know, whatever I said, send this, go with that. Oh, Constance, send this, do that. And right away it gets, gets where it has to go. Um, and I thank uh, Anna for the invitation as long as she's sitting here looking at me. So I have to make sure I, I cover all the bases properly because without that, nothing happens. So here's the quote from, <laughs> That's somebody once said. You invite the speakers; they speak, and then everybody goes to dinner. It's fine. Um, the um, it's fine. Um, here's the quote. Let's do the serious quote. An apostate who wishes to return, you have it on your sheet here, must shave his head. Lahavir al rosho taar with a razor. And again, this would apply to women too, as we'll see. There are more men in this whole picture, and I'll have to talk about why that is, if you'd like. Uh, but he must do all that. The, he or she must do all that shaving and immerse himself. And here's the money line. Just as a convert to Judaism must, and the Hebrew is ka-ger. An apostate is ka-ger, akin to a convert. Obviously, there's some difference, but pretty much same thing. Now, in, in fact, Ravia does allow that the former apostate's immersion does not have to take place during the daytime, which is required by technical Jewish law in the case of a convert who comes to Judaism. That last immersion, which sort of seals the whole thing, has to be done by day by a duly constituted rabbinic court, which according to the Talmudic law can only meet during the day. It has to do with the Sanhedrin as well. For those of you interested in the trial and crucifixion of Jesus, there are issues of such things. When did they meet? Where do they meet? There are prescribed meeting times, dates, times of day, a whole list of rules here. Uh, so that, Ravi, I was willing to say that the apostate's immersion former doesn't have to take place during the day. That's sort of a way of showing there's a slight difference, but it's very slight. But and here, let's go back the other way. Like the convert, according to Ravi, is a German Tosafist, the returning apostate must formally assert his reacceptance of Judaism, Kabbalah in Hebrew. This is not mysticism, this means an acceptance. He or she must reaccept in the presence of a tribunal of three, a rabbinic court. And so again, the only real difference between it, within the halachic process, according to these German authorities, the only difference is that the convert um, must be immersed by day, the returning apostate can be immersed by night, although to be fair, in the case of a male convert, a male convert must be circumcised prior to that immersion. The apostate would have been a Jew. There's no redo. Okay, and there's not even a symbolic drawing of blood, what's referred to in rabbinic terminology as hafat damri. So there are what I'll call small distinctions, but that's the point of identity. This set of requirements for returning apostate is rather striking. And clearly what Ravia, representing this approach, wanted to do was to formalize and verify the return of an apostate. He wasn't just being kind of tough. He wanted to verify this return in a Beit Din-like setting, in a rabbinic court setting. That's the main issue here. Again, akin to the process of conversion in Judaism, right? Sincerity, and how do you achieve that? You know, and people can just drop phrases, speak with forked tongue, or keep their fingers crossed, or however you want to say it but you do the best you can to try to uh, make that determination. Uh, just to follow this up, there's a passage in the Sifra commentary, book of Leviticus, or an old rabbinic work, a medieval commentary. Again, I don't mean to confuse you here, but this is part of the fun here. This commentary was initially attributed to the French Tosafist, Samson of Sans, Shimshon of Shans, an older contemporary of Ravia, but it too maintains that the accepted procedure for a penitent apostate is to shave his head, pare his nails prior to immersion. And this passage again refers openly to the returning apostate as a ger, a convert. And you have that in source Roman numeral two here. What's most interesting though for me is that as it has been shown conclusively in light of the figures, the medieval rabbinic figures cited within the Sifra commentary 
that this commentary could not possibly have been the work of Samson of Sons, but that it was in fact the work of a German contemporary of Ravia, whose teacher was one David of Munzburg, a figure who we know, he had contact with Ravia and with Ravia's father, Joel Halevi. So it's interesting that these tough, this tougher stance, again, not just tough, the stance which says that returning apostates are kager, treat them like converts to a large extent, this is a German rabbinic position. It's got nothing to do with, you know, uh, latitude, longitude, we'll talk about what this is about. That's exactly what I want to discover. Here's another interesting example. Avigdor ben Elijah, son of Elijah Cohen Sedek, or Katz, that's the abbreviation, who was a student of Ravia's Rhineland, Rhineland contemporary Simcha of Spire. Here's an interesting case. He assumes without question that a married couple who were both returning apostates, and as a couple apostatized, and they went together into the Christian community, they must both be immersed prior to the reacceptance into the Jewish community. They must shave off their hair prior to their immersion as a symbolic removal of all of the impurities of idolatry. That wasn't the question for him. The question was whether only whether the couple had to be separated for a period of three months, a period known in halakhic terms, Talmudic terms as havachana, to separate as was required of a female convert to Judaism, a female converts to Judaism, the issue here is if the woman subsequently gives birth, was the father a non-Jew or was the father a Jew, which obviously has implications. So the question here is a woman who's now a returning apostate, must she undergo that same test, that same check? Um, his response, I think his response, response was that while a returning female apostate would typically be required to do so as a convert, female convert must, in order to make this determination, a period of separation is not required in this particular instance, interestingly, because it can be assumed that this married couple continue to live only with each other during their period of apostasy. When a couple converts, the assumption is they're sort of rebelling against religion, not against each other. It's much different, by the way, if the wife or husband, one of them leaves, the spouse and the spouse remains Jewish, that sets off a whole other series of assumptions. So that's why Havchana, this particular separation wasn't needed, but it's very clear that he thinks that a female apostate who was not married or who had been married, but her husband wasn't with her during that period, must undergo this procedure or this period just as a convert must. Uh, just to say on the other side, there are some other interesting examples of what the assumptions of these rabbinic figures are about faithfulness and marriage for these apostates. Many of them assumed that, the again, the spouses would be faithful. Uh, they, they would not stray sexually if they apostatized together, but that's a different discussion. Uh, new dinner, new thing. Anyway, um, okay. Take us too far afield. Okay. In any case, while not all the German Tosafist formulations that I've been describing to you refer to a formal reacceptance of Judaism, a Kabbalah, as Raviya did, they all considered reverting apostates to be akin to converts who were required to submit to a reentry process that mirrored the conversion process. Now, I will say just very briefly, there are two Rhineian figures who don't quite agree. And they are the exception that proves the rule, but the nature of their exception is also significant. Uh, basically, what they said was the main goal of what we do with the returning apostate is to have them purified. And so everything else can be, again, that's not the case of a convert. A convert to Judaism doesn't have to be purified. They haven't sinned. It's the contrary, right? They're coming to a new acceptance or a new, a different uh, conception here. So for example, uh, Simcha of Spire held that the immersion required was to purify the penitent from sin while committed, this is for the returning apostate, while living among the Christians so that the apostate could now return to Judaism in a state of purity. And he has all kinds of Talmudic and other texts to support this kind of thing. Uh, the immersion required of a returning apostate, as I said before, is a penitential act, while the immersion that a convert must undergo is required by Jewish law unrelated to and beyond any act of penance. We don't see penance for somebody who's converting a new, you know, a, a cradle Christian who converts to Judaism doesn't need penance because when they were not Jewish, they were doing what they what they shouldn't be doing, and so on and so forth. And there's one other German Tosafist who also agrees with, but leave that very minority position out. And again, they are certainly the exceptions that prove the rule. Uh, by the mid to late 13th century, 
um, this German approach was very entrenched. And in fact, it made its way to Northern France. It's only at that point, once it became entrenched, it makes its way to Norman, Northern France. Just to give you two quick examples, and you have them, uh, the case of the husband and wife, by the way, was Roman numeral number three. It's a very interesting case. If you look at text number four on the uh, handout, uh, this is someone named Abraham Ben Ephraim, not a well-known figure, but his work is a very interesting work. It's an abridgment of Moses of Cousy, Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, a very important French legal text written in the 1240s. The abridgment is written around 1265, and that French work essentially cites Rabia's approach verbatim in the name of an identif unidentified authorities, Omrim. There are those who say, and he says, but let's follow this, um, just to, to make clear that this is not something that happened to fall in. This is one of nearly 10 instances in which this particular work, Kitsur Smog, again, who was, which was written by a French figure, includes passages from Ravia's works, although most other cases, not all, Ravia's name is mentioned. So the thing is now moving by the mid 13th century, this German sort of set of rules is moving to Northern France. One more, and that's in text number five here. And I've sort of given it, as you'll see, half and half to make it sort of even Stephen. This is an interesting way to do this. Um, in Numbers 8, Torah, Numbers uh, chapter 8, uh, the Torah talks about the rights that the Levites <clears throat> were required to undergo when they were initiated into the service of the tabernacle in place of the firstborn. The firstborn was supposed to serve in the tabernacle, and because of the sin of the golden calf, that was transferred over to the <clears throat> Levites. According to Numbers 8, when this happened, the Levites were meant, and Torah says this explicitly, the biblical text says it explicitly, they were immersed in holy water. Their clothing was not just washed, it was flooded, and they were required to shave their entire bodies. Here, the Chizkuni commentary in Roman numeral five, uh, named after its author, Hezekiah ben Manoach uh, Chizkuni, it's sort of a play on his name, his first name, which was compiled in Northern France around 1275, begins by citing Rashi's commentary on this verse, which includes a passage from the 11th century Provençal exegete Moses Hadarshan of Narbonne. It was one of Rashi's favorites. The appointment of the Levites, to just set this argument up, was meant to atone for the firstborn sins, the firstborn son's sin, of idolatry and worshiping the golden calf. Now you gotta follow this, you gotta go like this, a little Talmudic. Idolatry is characterized by uh, sacrificial offerings to the gods at the hands of officiants who are considered to be spiritually dead. Right? In other words, because idolatry is so outside the pale, those officiants are considered uh, spiritually dead, the ones who make this offer. Since a leper, Here's the Talmudics, is likewise characterized as dead by the Talmud, the Darim 64b, Mitzorach Hashuv Kemet, a leper has the status until the leper is able to be reintegrated into the community and so on. Hashuv Kemet, the Torah required the Levites to shave their entire bodies just as lepers must when they seek purification. So you're putting this whole idolatry piece here. And the Levites, since they are coming on the heels of this whole idolatry thing, like the leper, but they say, what's got to do apostates? Wait, like the leper, the Levites were also moving on some level, they were moving forward from the state of spiritual death associated with idolatry, the sin of the golden calf in particular, to renewed life and service of the Almighty. Now we get the, the hammer is lowered. You can take a look at the text as I read it. The passage in the Chizkuni commentary concludes, and I'm quoting this here, and for that reason, the same kind of transition, penitents, meaning apostates, are also required to shave themselves. In other words, the shaving of their body, the immersion is again, like those who are coming back from the dead because of some kind of sin of idolatry, right? So this is not just uh, coming back to where they once belonged. It's an old American popular, but anyway, uh, they're really coming almost like a convert, same kind of a thing. And this is now his Cooney, who was very French, they used to think he was Southern French because they never said the, they said the name Manoach never appeared in Northern France. After the 20th example of Manoach in Northern France, I said, no, that can't be. And others have already made that point as well. So this is a Northern French work uh, around 1275. Um, textual variants of this commentary add that returning apostates are required to shave themselves and to immerse. 
which was the case also for both lepers and Levites. However, among the Northern French Tosafist sources, and we're gonna to get to those right now, that required immersion for returning a pocket. So immersion they required. Rashi remains the least demanding, just show up. French Tosafists say immersion, that's your best act. Doesn't hurt too much. Doesn't cost a lot of money. I'm, you know, and that's something that's doable. And then you have the Germans who lay down all these further uh, requirements getting towards conversion. But until we get these two French late 13th century sources, you know, second half, 13th century beyond, which mention this, um, all the French sources up to this point, even the ones that require immersion, say there is no need for a, a formal reacceptance of Judaism before a rabbinic uh, tribunal, no demonstrative shaving of the hair beyond what might be required to accomplish an effective ritual immersion. And indeed, there were no tight comparisons between made between a reverting apostate and a new convert to Judaism. And that's to put it simply, the French, and make some sense, even as they departed from Rashi's very generous approach, right, of letting people just come back, you know, the proof is in the pudding, if you're back, you're back, and that's it, the French essentially agreed, they required something. Now, ritual immersion is not nothing, it's something, and it may be a very suggestive something, but even that didn't have to be, be, be done before a rabbinic court, we'll see, we're going to get to it now. The Germans are the ones who pushed this apostates returning alike converts. So now that we've seen that, let me now show you the French position. Let's sort of drill on that a little bit because these are subtleties, but I think we can see it nicely. Give you an example of a Frenchman who goes past Rashi, but stops far short of the German position. As it turns out, it happens to be Rashi's great grandson. I will say, you disagree with Rashi, the Zeta, the old Zeta would be unhappy. No, there's a famous ditty where uh, Rashi's grandson, Rabbeinu Tom, is told by one of his colleagues, one day, one day when Rashi is brought back to life in the Messianic age, they will take off the pottery shards that, with which the Jews by tradition, many Jews are buried, and Rashi will kind of pick his head up from out of the grave, and what will he see? I kid you not. You'll see your grandson coming to run you over in Talmudic reasoning. <laughs> now, this was, you know, in other words, uh, and, and, you know, this is uh, even in families that got along, if you know any old time, you know, sort of Eastern European or any European Talmudists from the last, uh, if the, you know, young grandson, I don't know if they were up to granddaughters yet, although some of them were very, they were very smart, some of them, they got to say something too. Uh, if they weren't arguing with the old Zeta, the old Zeta was saying, what's the matter with you? Why are you, why are you accepting this? So this was okay. But in any case, Rashi's great grandson, so we have a lot of uh, scholars of modern uh, religious uh, practice and uh, value, they can probably fill this in better than me. But Rashi's great grandson, whose name was Isaac of Don Pierre, died around 1190 was ask a question. This is all over manuscript. You can search everywhere printed that you can search and you won't see a word. I don't think it's a censorship problem. It's just, you know, listen, somebody will be something for me to write. So <laughs> that's what happens in manuscripts. You know, if you do manuscripts, uh, you know, that's, uh, I've never regretted ever looking at a manuscript. Even if one year, it didn't mean anything. It didn't mean anything for 20 years. Year 21, oh yeah, that's the one. Anyway, here's a manuscript text in which Re, this Isaac of Dompierre, I mean, Re is like calling him rabbi. You know, if you have no full name, it means you're so big, they just call you the rabbi. So Re of Dompierre was asked about a, what I'll call self-proclaimed returning apostate. And a, a person who had been an apostate who says, good news, Hazard, I've come back. Okay. And he then had ended up touching Jewish wine. And again, even Rashi, did say that during the actual period of apostasy, the one thing you couldn't do with an apostate, even going to Rashi, is quote unquote, break bread, drink wine, no kiddush, not allowed. That's too much contact. That's sort of, you know, more than just being nice. That's sort of just, you know, not acknowledging it at all. In any case, so this fellow had said that he's back and he had touched Jewish wine. The question is, what's the status? He had already rejoined the Jewish community. He returned to Jewish practice. So there was some evidence that he was playing along again. You know, I, that's the question. Was he, was it real or was it Memorex? Was he sincere or what was going on here? As, at least as far as anybody in the community could tell. And he asserted, albeit without any objective evidence, no tribunal, no record, that he had undergone immersion. Again, 
question is the extent and sincerity of his repentance had not been formally verified before a body of judges or anybody else publicly for that matter. Again, people saw him, you'll forgive me in shul, but what does that mean? Right? You know, he could have been shul to get the latest World Series score or whatever. But anyway, uh, I'm joking. Anyway, um, what's that? Only, only a little. I'm still, I still haven't gotten over the Yankees. Well, you're Toronto, you have your own problems here. Anyway, oh, the whole act, oh, whatever. It, yeah, don't talk about that. In permitting the wine, I really said, the wine is fine. The wine that he touched, kosher. Because the presumption is that this person's status as a member in good standing of the Jewish community is uh, met. The fact that he's in the synagogue, the fact that he's hanging around with the community, he's in. Now, hold on a second. He says he's a legend in his own mind. He says he immersed himself. He says he returned. Now, you can see that he returned, but he's vouching for himself. Here, he makes a very interesting distinction. And I, I think Rashi, his great grandfather, would have said, ah, smart boy. Re notes that unlike the immersion required by Jewish law for a convert to Judaism, which is designated in halachic terms as a chova, an absolute religious obligation, you can be the most sincere convert in the world if you don't follow the instructions. It's in your unfortunate cases. It's you can't overlook certain requirements. That's the way it is. It's a chova. That immersion must be the capstone of the whole experience. It's a chova, an absolute halachic obligation, at least according to uh, very traditional Jewish law. The ritual immersion for returning apostate, listen to this, is merely a mitzvah. What means a mitzvah? A proper religious act. But that act is a good thing to do. It's very good to do it. Chova, must do, mitzvah, should do, can do, may do, right? Distinction. Again, apostate, Nice. Convert? Absolutely. Notice the two categories are separated, and that's this French position. All right. Um, if, in fact, says Re in this case, so what are the, what's the evidence? He says he was in the mikvah. He, he immersed himself. He says he's sincere when he comes to the synagogue. And, you know, again, these are small towns, especially in northern France. So there weren't 18 butcher shops where you could, you know, oh, I bought on sale in the other town over there. Either you were, either you were there or you weren't there, right? Uh, almost, you were with us or against us, almost, right? Cesare, since this act is only a mitzvah, um, uh, let's say he hadn't undergone this immersion. Again, perhaps because of what Rashi had said, his present status as a member of the Jewish community is not compromised, provided that he appears to be observing Jewish law. So we basically, the act that's required, that's absolutely required, sine qua non, if he never comes to the synagogue or never appears to be observing anything Jewish. And again, you couldn't hide out as sometimes people can, as we learned from COVID, not that easy, right? That's the only act that's absolutely needed. The immersion is a nice religious act, a mitzvah. They want a mitzvah, the one mitzvah. But there's some wiggle room there, right? And according to Re, interestingly, this idea that the former apostate has come back to the community is quote unquote, easily verified by the community. Again, it's a small community. You don't have to be a theologian to know, is he doing what he's supposed to be doing or not? And therefore, or as a result of this, the more formal verification that a convert is required to undergo is not required in the case of an apostate. So think about that Ravia, and the Re is a little bit older. He dies in 1190, he dies around 1225. It's almost contemporaneous, right? I mean, there are differences, but it's almost contemporaneous. The German position is, treat them largely like converts. The French position is, hmm, separate. This is so because now, makes good sense. What's the difference between a, ver a reverting apostate and a convert? Very simply, says Reed, the reverting apostate is not changing his religious status or his level of required observance to one that is completely foreign or new, right? He was once part of the Jewish community. A convert wants to change his religious status, his identity, his religious identity to something that he, had, he or she had never been in theory. They might have wanted to be, they might have been playing along, but they weren't. The apostate is going back again, as I mentioned earlier before, to where he or she once belonged. Right? And therefore, no formal act is required 
in the same way that it is for a former convert to Judaism. The Ravia had to sort of show, okay, we'll let the apostate do a little less and go to mikvah at night. But otherwise, acceptance, formal rabbinic tribunal, all that stuff, pretty much kager. And Ria saying, absolutely not. And therefore, and by the way, you see the difference very simply. If a convert to Judaism, again, according to rigorous Jewish law of the Talmud, uh, at least as the Talmud defines it, would make a personal declaration that I've accepted Judaism, a convert, not in front of a formal rabbinic court, right? The halachic status, according to Talmud would be not there. But in the case of this returning apostate, Re says, there. Again, because the distance that has to be traversed, if you will, just using these terms to give us a perspective, is that much smaller. Okay. Um, now, it gets more interesting here. The reverting apostate whose case was brought to Ree's attention had apparently also asked him to sign a document. He wanted a document that would verify his return. Re was a great rabbi. He wanted a, a tuuda. He wanted a document. Re, however, refused to provide it precisely because he said that this formal doc uh, documentation was required or was helpful only for a convert, but not for a reverting apostate. A convert needs to be documented. A returning apostate does not. That same difference in the status uh, for whom the return to the community and prior practice is sufficient. And we have from one of Reed's students a similar case. Again, you'll say a lot of apostasy going on. Yes, there was, although again, the absolute numbers we don't know. There have been attempts. We'll talk about a little bit about that before I finish. Um, Reed's student, uh, Isaac Benaber of Dompierre, known by the ac acronym Ritzba, who died in 1209, wrote regarding a similar case. And you have this in the um, in Roman numeral seven, um, that if the former apostate had returned to the community, and this is interesting, in the case of Red Spot, this particular convert, you know, you learn interesting details here. He was very sincere. He said to Ree, I'm really back and I'll prove it to you. You can hold my wallet for safekeeping over the Shabbat. Anybody who plots with his wallet for religious reasons, either religious or a little, you know, that's, that's not bad. Ree said, ah, great. This means he's really sincere about coming back. He put his money where his mouth is, so to speak. All right. Um, Re said, oh, that's a palpable sign of his return to Jewish observance. All right. Says Ritzba, he's a Baal Tshuva. He's returned. All right. Additional verification uh, beyond immersion in the mikvah, again, is not required. And here's the interesting phrase in that passage. And again, you've got it. Um, I, I gave it to you with the, with the um, transliterated Hebrew here. The, because the domek tzat lager. Plus, he's a little similar to a convert. Ravia says he's big similar, big time similar, and Spa says he's a little similar. You know, obviously, there's some point of similarity. So even the verbiage seems to reflect this. Interestingly, uh, Ritzba's brother, a very famous Tosafist, Samson of Sons, who I mentioned earlier, um, he says he has a completely different view here, but even his view fits within the French approach. He has something, a new point here. He quotes a Gaonic response I'm attributed to a Rav Tzamach Gaon of the late ninth century. I don't know if can tell us more about him, um, who didn't require immersion at all for returning apostate, right? Um, uh, and he said, if you're gonna require an immersion unless it's witnessed, it's not worth anything. And the Northern French Tosafist said, no need to witness. Uh, however, that's the good news. Rav Tzamach Gaon is Gaonic figure in the East in the ninth century. Um, required that the former apostate undergo lashes, another Gaonic view, that hurts, uh, required as well, and stand before the congregation and confess publicly what he had done and what sinful behaviors he had been unable to resist. So Samson of San said, listen, if this returning apostate is in fact really sincere, he should be prepared to go before rabbinic scholars who could verify his, a court, who could verify his true intentions and commitments. Now, so you'll say, oh, he's very stringent. He's a Frenchman. No, although Rash Mishan suggests this aspect of more stringent requirements, which sounds like what Ravia asked for later, he wants to be adopted. It's nonetheless clear that he did not consider the returning apostate to be, to be akin in any way to a convert for Judaism, because what convert to Judaism has to undergo lashes or public confessions <laughs> makes no sense, again, because they had not sinned in the past. So that whole aspect of things is completely different. And he, this Rashmi Shantz, who has this sort of suspicion, never mentions the word Geirim or Geirut. Converts are not even part of his discussion. Rather, the apostate is a Jew who has sinned grievously 
and must now properly represent himself both before God and man in order to return to the Jewish community. And again, you have that text in Roman numeral uh, number eight. One more text, and then we'll try to put this whole thing together. In text number nine, we have a 13th century uh, Tosifist passage from the study hall um, at Evreux in Normandy, a very interesting study hall, first day of the 13th century, which posits a quote unquote new Talmudic source, you know, newly identified Talmudic source for the, to justify the immersion of returning apostates. So this is French. Immersion with this group, yes, not like Rashi, they held that the immersion was necessary, but listen to the reason. The penitent apostate must undergo immersion, la sot hekera, the translation of that phrase in order to, or the definition to signify a distinction or demarcation between the apostate's activities as an apostate and his or her renewed status as a full member of the Jewish community, which is, which is also characterized in this passage as mishum ma'ala. Right? In travel terms, I was on a plane today, an upgrade. I got one, but it's only an hour and a half flight. So anyway, they still have, they still haven't redone the miles, so they still I'm think, it's just like I'm flying every week. But anyway, let's have a couple of weeks. In any event, um, what's the model for this immersion? A, interestingly, again, a Talmudic model, a Canaanite slave who had been completely freed, right? A Canaanite slave is someone, a pagan, who, when he comes into the, the status, uh, is already obligated in a variety of commandments in the Jewish home, which was treated as a kind of conversion to Judaism, sort of a different sort of conversion. And as such, the slave was initially circumcised and immersed in the mikvah. At the point that he is freed, however, no circumcision is required, although the Talmud in Tractate Yivamot does talk about a second immersion. And there's a great controversy. Maimonides has one approach, others have a different approach. According to this French study hall, the immersion signifies that the slave is transitioning from a state of slavery to one of complete freedom, similar in empirical terms to the return of the former apostate to a higher status or returning to that high status as a fully recognized and religiously obligated member of the Jewish community. Here again, initial conversion to Judaism does not stand in any way at the root of this procedure for the returning apostate. This is not, this is not what's happening for in conversion. This is what's happening in this case. You're returning, you're sort of being promoted in this regard. Now that's true what convert is, but again, it's a much more stark distinction and it doesn't have any connection, no connection is made between that and conversion. So we have this dichotomy. I think I've spent some good time with you and I hope it's clear. Now the question is, why did this happen? How do we understand this dichotomy between Germany and Northern France, right? Again, the German requirements view the apostate in many respects as a convert, require many, some of the same things, just to leave a little bit of daylight. The French approach, converts over here, apostates over here, never, well, not never the twain shall meet, but the twain don't really meet at all. They could sort of wave at each other. I'm just being a little silly. So in order to solve this problem, this is sometimes we do in medieval Jewish uh, literature and culture, uh, we'll solve this problem with another problem. There's another aspect, or resolve both of them, uh, related to conversion to Judaism, not apostasy, conversion to Judaism, about which rabbinic sources in Northern France and Germany expo express rather different perspectives as well. Where again, the Germans hold one thing, the French hold something else about converts. And this is coming from a different angle completely. And some of you, if you're involved in medieval studies, uh, will certainly uh, resonate to this. Um, the extent to which these rabbinic sources refer to Christian pressures being applied to thwart such conversions, right? What I'm gonna argue, I'll just tell it to you quickly and I'll give you a little bit of evidence that you will believe me. Um, in Northern French rabbinic sources, there is little mention of any such pressure, whether or not it actually existed. In other words, it's not that the French church was, or the clergy in France were thrilled about it, but the rabbinic sources, and thrilled here again, let's be clear, conversion from Christianity to Judaism. Rabbinic French sources, French rabbinic sources, don't really refer to this pressure. Um, moreover, there is evidence for a fully developed rabbinic policy in Northern France to ease the conversion of Christians to Judaism, not as a mission, but as an easement. And not that there were so many actual cases as far as we could tell, although again, some people have tried to give us some stats and the stats are pretty interesting. France, the stats are bigger in France than they are in Germany. So in other words, in the case of converting Christians to Judaism, which obviously is not a simple matter, 
for whatever reason, and I don't think it's because the clergy of France said, ah, we don't care, or the leaders of the church, we don't care. In fact, there were statements to the contrary. The rabbinic sources, the rabbinic figures did not, don't relate to this pressure. They don't talk about it. They say, we have a plan. The plan is you're welcome and you do this and you do that. And we have some cases of big Tosafists who are harboring converts and so on. And they seem to be just kind of moving along. Within the literature of the German Tosafists, on the other hand, there are several strongly worded statements that express grave concern about Christian reprisals. Um, and this I didn't give you on the handout, but let me tell it to you now. Uh, Sefer Asufot, a, uh, which we still need a good edition of, it's a manuscript, the Halakha Compendium from the second quarter of the 13th century, whose anonymous author is linked both to Ravia, who we talked about a, uh, quite a bit in Lesser of Worms, writes, and I quote, at present, it is a life-threatening act, sakanat nefashot, to convert anyone to Judaism. Period. No such statement exists in France. Did they think it? Were they worried about it? They don't say it. He says it. While a passage in this, people might know, in the slightly earlier Sefer Hasidim, the Book of the Pious, right, again, written between Judith the Pious and his student, the Lazar of Worms, somewhere in the first quarter or so of the 13th century, indicates that the circumcision, a particular convert in waiting, somebody who's online, who's ready to convert, could not be performed. They needed the circumcision to sort of finish it all up, right, to get to the, the mikvah, because the Jews of his town feared that the Christians would become aware of it. Then you have reports of fear on the scene. Move the clock a little bit. In the second half of the 13th century, mayor of Rothenburg, Rami Wittenberg, describes a situation in which four Jews were compelled by the ruling authorities to testify under oath, under the threat of confiscation of their property, if not worse, if they did not tell the truth about the identity of, of the fifth Jew, who was in fact a gay or a convert. So somebody did convert, but they were being asked to sort of rat on him. Although according to Jewish law, the four Jews would have been permitted to swear falsely to the effect that the fifth was not a convert uh, or to otherwise prevaricate since this situation proposed a real and present danger, they ended up truthfully saying, yeah, he's a convert. Maharam at this point exclaims, he says, oh, did we dodge the bullet here, literally. Most fortuitously, this convert was not then burned at the stake. Since, quote, this is from Mayor of Rothenburg, when apostates from Judaism to Christianity testify about a convert to Judaism, he is burned. That's, that'll get him in trouble. How much more so when Jews testify against him? You know, you'll be hoisted on your own petard. So again, there's this tension. Doesn't mean that nobody converted in Germany. Some got through. But the statements about, let's not go further, let's stop right here. Instead, the gear in this instance was let off with a stiff monetary penalty, which the four Jews who testified about his status, Maharam ruled, they had to sort of pay him back. But that's not the main point. It is Maharam's expression of astonishment that the convert to Judaism escaped death in this case, which is the most striking aspect of this response. Similarly, Chaim or Zara, who's a student of Maharam, again, maintains that there was a certain rabbi Isaac who was acting out of piety, who circumcised converts to Judaism. Again, people got through, but this caused this community to be threatened with bodily harm by the Christian authorities. All of these descriptions suggest the pressure brought by Christians in Germany, brought to bear by Christians in Germany, uh, when their co-religions sought to convert to Judaism, involved much more than sharp rhetoric. So again, I, I'm not suggesting that there was no such uh, response or statement in France, the German rabbinic authorities are more worried about it. Okay, let's try to put this together with a final subtle point, and I think we'll have at least something that we can talk about. Um, now, what else has happened? There's one more thing here that I want to, another overlay that affects both France and Germany, but that I think will help us understand the difference in the rabbinic positions. We're in the late 12th through the 13th centuries, all right? Um, we have seen that in both France and Germany, greater demands were made on apostates, right? Uh, at least immersion in Northern France, if not more in Germany. Now, why? The rabbis woke up one morning and said, ah, we got something new. Maybe, but I don't think so. It was something new that they were forced to confront. What's happening in terms of Christian attitudes toward Judaism at this time? The answer is, that there is, first of all, a sustained renewal of violence against Jews in both Northern France and Germany beginning in the late 12th century. Not as momentous as the First Crusade, but as Robert Chazen has written about numerous times, 
whole series of persecutions that Fry and Rabban in his Sefer Zechira, he died 1196, 97, talks about 11 or 12 separate incidents between 1171 and 1196 in both the Rhineland Island and in France. The numbers of Jews killed were not as high as the First Crusade, but it's not about the numbers. It's about the threat to life and property. And again, I don't want to make everybody nervous, but once you have you know, terrible acts, the threat or the idea that they could happen again is even more scary. And so this was a hundred years after the first crusade, it's like a kind of a mini redux and that scared the willies out of people to use a non-academic phrase. So that's on the ground and that's happening both in the Rhineland and Northern France. In addition, newly articulated, especially pernicious accusations have been leveled by churchmen against the Jews at this time, led first by Rupert of Deutz right, in the Rhineland, who died in 1129, and presented even in much more vituperative terms by Petrus Venerabilis, Peter the Venerable, abbot of Cluny, who died in 1156. They put forward the position that Jews had by now become the arch enemies of Christianity. That's their phrasing, more or less. Although the approaches of Rupert and Peter were not adopted uncritically by all subsequent Christian thinkers in their writings, thankfully, there is no doubt that a new element of blatant animus had been introduced into the medieval Christian attack on Jews and Judaism. And here, just to quote the late great Gavin Langmuir, uh, the hatred of Jews, he said, moved by the middle of the 12th century, you know, as this thing was, everything we're discussing today, that's sort of the kind of lit the fire. From from a rational form of anti-Judaism, rational quotes, to a visceral hatred. Now, what does this mean? Within Northern European society, I want to put it all together. The apostate just became more of a, thus became more of a threat to the Jewish community as well. Right? As Jews become greater enemies of Christianity, an apostate, right, somebody who's on the other side, is not so neutral, just to use relational terms. An apostate from Judaism was now seen as something an ally of the increasingly hostile enemy of the Jews that Christianity had become. So now let's plug in what we have. German Tosafists took the lead in incorporating these views, not only with regard to the scope and severity of the rights that a returning apostate had to overgo, uh, undergo, right? If you're more of an enemy, your reentry must be treated more carefully, more in a more circumspect way. And also by limiting the doctrine that Rashi had put forward of Af Pishachatai Yisrael, who, as it related to an ongoing apostate in a range of areas of Jewish law and life. And this is a whole different thing that I have described in the book. Can you lend money to an apostate at interest? Rashi said, absolutely not, because he's still a Jew. French Tosafists generally said, absolutely not, with minor exceptions. German Tosafists said, some of them said, let's give it a shot. Uh, you know, I'm being silly. I got to. These are serious topics, but we can we can negotiate here. Um, a Leverite marriage, uh, Khalitsa, woman of a brother, uh, a fellow, unfortunately passed away, no children. His wife has to have Khalitsa. She has to be separated from the brother by the ceremony of Khalitsa. Rashi said, and it's not that Rashi disliked chained women more. It's that he, uh, uh, it, it, or he cared about them less. It's that he liked Jews as a whole more. Rashi said, listen, I'd love to say that that's not required because he's an apostate, but a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. German Tulsifists said, we can talk. And they did talk. And they did figure out ways to say, this Christian apostate, this uh, apostate brother, out of the picture. So in all these areas, these are the things I talk about in the book, you have, so the Germans really took the lead here. And um, they moved with the ball. They ran with the ball. Um, and uh, a partial list of these things, again, economic and marital issues, lending money and interest for apostate, status, sexual relations that a Jewish woman had with an apostate and the effects on Jewish marriage, disqualification of an apostate from performing chalitza, assuming he's the only brother available, and so on and so forth. The formulations of rabbinic authorities in northern France and Germany that have been noted above with regard to the path of an apostate's return, along with those that are found in these other areas of Jewish law, proceed primarily along established halachic lines. Again, the rabbis were not such, they were not, you know, army generals on the battlefield, let's try the pincer movement, let's try the Hail Mary, let's try the something, you know, that's not what was happening. They were working as rabbinic leaders. Nonetheless, uh, to, to not say this is almost, would almost be comical. Changing societal factors also played a central and a very legitimate role in the thinking of the Tosafists. So you had to keep your eye if you're a rabbinic authority, not just on where Jewish law is going or might be going, 
but on what's happening out there in terms of Jewish society and how this should be balanced. And so there are stringencies overall in both geographic areas, again, with Germany sort of leading, leading the way, right? At the same time, however, the specific differences and distinction that we've noted between the views of the Tosafists in Northern France and those of Germany with regard to referring apostates can also be related to different perceptions concerning conversion to Judaism in Germany and Northern France, right? Again, the Germans are feeling this enemy status apparently more, at least they're expressing it more. Since conversion to Judaism seemed, and, and it's more than just what the rabbis are feeling, this is, this is an important detail. Since, and I'm just about done, since conversion to Judaism seemed more possible, at least in theory, and again, it was not a cakewalk, in Northern France during the Tosafist period, all right? So we've got a problem with the Christians. We've got Rasha over here saying, just bring them back. We'll take a middle position, why? Since, because we can also, converts are still in play in Northern France. Um, the halakhic categories and status of converts to Judaism and of apostates from Judaism, including those who sought later to return, had to be maintained as fully distinct. If we're gonna take in converts in Northern France, we can't muddle or muddy the status lines between converts and apostates because we've got the convert question, we've got the apostate question, these are both live questions and muddying it or muddling it will create halakhic unclarity, which believe it or not matter to these rappers. Anyway, um, and therefore these categories had to be maintained as fully distinct. So there's a societal issue, but there's also a rabbinic, Talmudic, Jewish learning kind of an issue here as well. A person born as a Jew who apostatized and then sought to return to Judaism could not be assigned the same halachic regimens or status as a convert to Judaism. France was just not possible because there were people actually coming back, converting too. So you need to maintain these distinct lines. In Germany, however, where conversion to Judaism was considered, at least by sub-rabbinic authorities, to be nigh impossible during this period, there's a manual for circumcisers where the, uh, the book says, and if you have a convert, it talks about a female convert, uh, obviously no circumcision there, but if you have a convert, um, here's what you do, but we're not gonna talk about that because it doesn't happen anymore. That's Germany, yeah? it doesn't happen anymore. It's a manual, it's not a, you know, the same kind of rabbinic work as we're looking at here, but in Germany where conversion to Judaism was considered at least by some rabbinic authorities to be nigh impossible during this period because of the dangers involved, the growing negativity towards apostasy and apostates could be allowed to expand, right? Converts aren't coming. Therefore, we can sort of direct the enemy of our enemy or the friend of our enemy, right? The apostate, we can let them sort of, again, I'm being very, you know, uh, conniving here in my way, the way that I'm saying it, but you, you understand the picture, we can allow that category to expand um, uh, effectively at, at rendering the apostate kager as one who is akin to, as akin to one who was coming to Judaism for the first time. A convert to Judaism who, to Judaism who did not fulfill the prescriptions of the rabbinic court could not be accepted. These same requirements as we've seen with minor distinctions were now placed on reverting apostates in Germany not in France, reflecting in a more graphic way the spiritual distance that they had to traverse in order to return to the Jewish community. It wasn't just about observing Jewish law, it was about distancing yourself from that enemy and being welcomed back into the camp in a full and complete way. And perhaps what I'm suggesting is if we link these items together, we have a real strong case to be made that will explain all of these to us. I thank you very much.